Welcome to the Flyman Fishing Show, where we talk fly fishing, fly tying, and everything in between. I'm your host, Scotty Davis. Today we have uh, Mike Taylor from Fins West. How are you today? What's up, Scotty D? Ah, Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Um, so no fishing this morning, huh? No, man. I mean, fuck's going to snow tomorrow. Is it? Is it calling for snow up there? Yeah, it's not. It's going to snow, you know, just up the road in Virginia, but man, the weather, the weather's been crazy down here since we got here. Yeah. And you just moved to North Carolina from Colorado. When, when was that? Like about a year ago? No, uh, it's getting, it's getting there. Not really. I think we rolled in in end of September, 1st of October. Of right before COVID, I guess. Well, right in the middle of oh, this past one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where in Colorado were y'all living? So we were about an hour west of Colorado Springs in the Platte River Valley there. Nice. It's a pretty place. Yeah. Uh, it you, was a good place. And you moved to um, North Carolina strictly for the Bojangles, or was there other things involved there? No, it was Bojangles only. We coordinated our move where there's a Bojangles. I mean, you can't have one down the road, right? Because right. that's too much. But it's 15 minutes away. Perfect. That, that's that's safe enough. What's your go-to at Bojangles? Well, I got great story, changed my life. You know, I'm a big Bojangles fan. But as you know, trying to eat a steak, egg, and cheese, sausage, egg, and cheese, running down the road on a biscuit, it falls all in your glasses, down in your floorboard. Yep. My brother, I mean, changed my life literally last week. He said, man, just get a sausage, egg, and cheese on a bun. At Bojangles? At Bojangles. Oh, so oh yeah, like the and, ones for the Cajun filet sandwiches. That's right. Wow. So I pulled in and said, I risk it, and said sausage, egg, and cheese on a bun with a little mayo dude life changer driving down the road really i think the biscuits there i could do without the bacon egg and cheese just as long as i had the biscuit just well i'm cool with a biscuit but you know man you're from down here you try to drive down the road with that big old fluffy buttermilk biscuit half of it ends up in the floorboard yeah that's true <laughs> so you save that for you know for home or whatever yeah um so how's the how have you adjusted to north carolina fishing is it how long were y'all in colorado first of all about 30 years about yeah. 28 years so i mean i've been gone from carolina for that long yeah and you were born out east right now born in boone well outside of boone so yeah. we were from the mountains but we had a place down on the coast so we came down you know growing up a ton yeah and what and my prompted, whole family's from here actually is that what prompted the move back here Man, it was it was a couple of things. I mean, you know, we had to have a tick list. It had been on the books for a while. But man, the older you get, snow, constant snow becomes less enjoyable. I mean, having to go, we had a two mile driveway. I had to plow all winter long just to get out. It's cold. I'm old, man. It's cold. So uh, we were done with that. And obviously, you know, salt is, it's just good stuff to be able to roll out on your dock and jump in the boat and fish year round was another big thing. Family. Yeah. Family's another, another thing. Everybody's here and we've been gone for a while and, you know, without offending a bunch of people, man, Colorado, especially that, that Southern edge and all the fit, it's getting crowded, man. I mean, badly. The rivers or just the towns or all of it? Everything. Yeah. I mean, I, we we were in Children of the Corn, small town, <laughs> right on the Platte River. You know, we had our choice. And, man, you know, just to go into the small town in the summer, you know, it, it was insane with people. And then the rivers, you know, God bless people fishing. I want people on the river fishing. But, man, it's just – it's, it's going to be a management problem before too much longer. Yeah. Yeah, there's only so much water, I guess yeah so what are you what are you predominantly fishing for here you're in the pamlico sound pamlico river area yeah so we're in the basin we've got the pan we're on the pamlico river on a creek and you, you know what i mean by creek not yeah. like colorado but um off of the pamlico river then you got the pamlico sound just a short run down the road then you got the noose if you turn and run south so a bunch of water man bunch of from salt to to brackish and then you go up some of these things and you run into freshwater bass it's just a lot of fish in here nice yeah that's a little different um if nobody's ever been up there the noose river that's wide it's what isn't it a mile wide in some parts oh it's longer than that i mean you get down to the mouth i mean the creek that i'm in 
I, I, man, I wouldn't want to swim across it on a hot summer day with a life jacket. It's, it's pretty yeah. wide in the Pamlico. No way. Pamlico is huge. Yeah. So the, the, the sight fishing possibilities there, you, you're more kind of blind casting for everything. Yeah, totally. And that's, that's been the curve, like down in your neighborhood, pushing reds and, and tailing reds is the game. Um, up here, not so much. I mean, I've seen a few, you can find some tailing reds and you get up in the shallow creeks and, you know, you can see some fish pushing, but it's more, you know, you're just looking for the ambush spots. You're looking for the oyster beds and yeah, you're, you are blind casting. You look for bait. I mean, again, I'm not the consummate professional down here, even, you know, being from here, I'm learning a bunch, but you look for the bait. We don't have tides here. All our tides are wind driven. Right. So, you know, it's not a title situation. So it's learning curve, man, for me, for sure. Yeah. So what kind of setups would you be kind of prodding around with what, what flies and are you throwing intermediate lines or floating lines? Yeah. You know, man, I, if like, we'll talk about sinking lines here for a bit up on like the Roanoke river, Chowan river for stripers, it's deep. I, I mean, super deep. So you've got to throw, you know, bomb lines to get down to them. Out here, man, there, it ain't 20 feet at the, you know, that's 20,000 leagues under the sea, 20, 20 feet here. Yeah. Um, you know, our water around here is 15 foot at the max. So I found instead of struggling, throwing a bunch of sinking mess and getting down, I just pinch a piece of shot on or maybe a, a sink tip instead of a sinking line. Hmm. and just drop it in and it seems to be doing fine maybe i can catch more with a yeah. sinking line but yeah man it, it works works yeah. well and mainly reds and trout you have a striper run there as oh, well. oh yeah man. i mean we've got resident striper here right now but yeah when they come in to go run the rivers you know they make a left turn and come up our creeks and you know I, there's so many people fishing for specks down here sea trout mm -hmm that I, I'm fishing for stripers. They pull harder, they're huge, they thump the shit out of your fly when they hit it. So yeah, man, I just right out front, just been tagging stripers for yeah. sure. I grew up on Lake Murray, uh, freshwater lake, and I was a, a, a bass kid. I couldn't have cared less about stripers. And then f finally somebody took me striper fishing, and man, I felt so dumb. I was like, I, I, I wouldn't get out of bed to catch a largemouth if there's striper there. They, like you said, they just tug so much, so much different. It's a hell of a fight. Oh yeah, man. And, and they eat. I mean, like I said, we've had, somebody told me, I don't, whatever, a couple of weeks ago that from November 1st until February, I mean, November 2nd, February 2nd is the second rainiest and coldest temperature and, and weather that's been recorded in North Carolina ever. Wow. Go figure the irony when we move here to wear flip-flops in the winter, you know, we've had, but, um, where was I going with that? Uh, oh yeah. The, you know, the fishery, when the salinity gets hammered by all the fresh water running in from the tribs and falling from the sky and then water temperature below, man, it's been below 50 for weeks. The specs and, and for the reds, for that matter, the residents, man, they're locked jaw. They're down deep. You know, you've got to really be dialed in to hit those guys, but man, the striper, fishery for me at least to save the winter because you can roll out you know 40 45 46 degree water after a rain and they're eating man so, do you do you find them on the surface at all kind of flip in and doing their little surface activity not really i mean yeah. i've thrown I, let's say on a spinning rod right because right. that that's a whole nother thing as well one thing you do down here or at least i do is uh, in searching so i'll go throw a spinning rod and find where some fish are and then immediately switch to the fly, yeah. right? If there's no bait busting and stuff. So I have thrown some top water on the, on the spin rig and you know, the top water bite is out here has just not been on. So you just look for the cover, look for the right places they be and just drop a game changer in, strip it, thump. Yeah. It's there. You fish a lot of the game changer styles. Man, I knew before I moved here, fishing with the game changer, you know, out West, you know, throwing streamers. I, I knew that was going to work here. I mean, my God, it looks, you know, men Hayden, I mullet, you can, and the movement, I, I knew it was going to be the ticket and 
first thing I tied on when I got here and I rarely change it up unless it's warmer and I'm throwing a shrimp pattern, right? Yeah. So yeah, um, and man, they work, they work under the pop and fly. I mean that during the warmer months when we got here, I, you know, was playing around with that gig. Game changers, the micros under there work great. Yeah. So, yeah. I fought that the pop and fly for a long time. I, I, I refused to do it. And I even still is kind of, I don't want people to see it. You know, I don't know. I'm not a, a thing. I'm a bobber type type fisherman, but that is a lot of fun to fish. Um, I found, especially those big trout, you can not be paying attention. And when they hit that thing, it'll pop the hell out of that cork. So it's a, an audible sensation to fish in those. Yeah, totally. And I mean, it makes sense, man. And again, it's been a learning curve. I, I'm not <laughs> saying I'm anything that I am coming, you know, back here. But, you know, people throw popping corks on a spin rig here and have, I mean, it's just, it's the way to go. I mean, you can stick a bunch of reds and specks on these things. So it makes sense to adapt that to the fly side, especially up here in this fishery where you're not sight fishing. And, you know, you need that audible pop, sounds like fish feeding and it works i mean i'm not kidding day two i was here walked out on the dock never thrown one of these things in my life threw it in boom yeah. redfish <laughs> right off the bat so uh, that kind of sells you right welcome home <laughs> it's good stuff i just weather though man weather needs to change oh yeah it's been bad here it's real foggy here today yeah so what about y'all's water temperature H have y'all had cold it's, unseasonably cold weather or not 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 really it's been a real slow gradual drop of here a couple of degrees here and there um i think it's right about where yours is low, upper 40s low low 50s but it's really clear our water gets real real clear in the winter and uh redfish are schooling it's it's been been very good winter fishing wise yep. right man and i mean dude it is i'm not kidding you it's 180 degree different type of fishery i was just I was talking to um, who, the articulate folks the yeah. other day on the podcast. He Marvin. was asking about, what's that? Marvin. Marvin, yeah. And he was asking me, you know, about the winter down here in the clear water. And, and you know, man, once you get up past the Crystal Coast down there, it changes. I mean, the water does clear up, which is great. But, you know, it's not like you guys down there. It's where you're. It helps with the sight fishing. It, it filters with the tides. Right. That doesn't happen here, man. I mean, the, when the water and the rivers get muddy and the sound gets muddy, it takes two or three days to, to clear back out and get fish in. Yeah, I guess just that sheer volume of water coming down, too. Yeah, that's it, man. But then again, you hook up the Hog Island. I drive 30 minutes taking the ferries, and I'm pulling in gin clear water just right down in core in the crystal coast so it's kind of best of both worlds yeah that you're in a, you're in a prime spot and you're not too far from harker's island either right no albie I mean, fishery what, what yeah it's it's again right up just jump on a few ferries and you've got the coastline and again we're on the inner banks which was a decision because again the diversity is good you're not jammed right up on the ocean for storms and people for that yeah. matter but yeah the fishing diversity is is huge and that's one reason we chose this area is just we can mix it up and and do a bunch of different things instead of you know polling every day which again i wouldn't mind that either right but yeah and you can do that here man i mean again there's not i mean i say this for folks listening i you know some eye rolling but it, there's not a lot of shit fly fishing in general up here in these northern fisheries so you know the potentials here are some great folks doing it but you know, as far as guide trips and, and I, I ain't seen anybody throwing a fly rod since I've been here on the water. Uh, really? Yeah. And again, yeah, down on the news, Gary and those guys, absolutely. But like I said, I'll, I'll be polling just cause I like to poll to get into these spots and, you know, Kristen or you know, my brother, some, I'll be on the front of the boat fishing and people just, <laughs> they, they just are sitting there looking at us like, what are these idiots doing up here? I know I had a stripping bucket and I had a bunch of people ask me about the stripping bucket, you know, Your trash can. Yeah. Or toilets. They didn't know what they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's good. And then obviously a polling platform, you know, out here, I, it's, yeah, people know what it is just cause we're, we're all down here on the coast, but I've not seen a single one up here past Minnesota beach, not a one. 
And your bigger boat is what kind of boat did you get? So it's a privateer. So it's a beaver, 22 foot center console. Very cool. And I saw yeah, you just you redid your console again, right? I did. I mean, I, I got it from Richard Andrews, who's tar Pam guide service, mm -hmm. which, you know, great guy. And it was his duck boat, even though, you know, these boats are made for the Pamaco basin down here. Um, you know, he didn't, he didn't have it all super dialed in duck boat, get to the blind, throw up a scissor rig. So I just redid it just by, that's what I do, but yeah. yeah, redid the console, made it a little more comfortable to be out in the water for longer times. Yeah. And you got to have it, man. The, the hog is a great boat in these creeks and tribs. I mean, it's amazing, but you light out in the Pamaco and the wind picks up and you're done. You're stuck. You're yeah, you're, yeah. you're done. Well, let's talk about uh, Finns West for a little bit. It's a very unique business you're in. For people that don't know, you 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 go around to lodges and and tr basically train the the staff what to do in cases of emergencies, right? Yeah, man. I mean, is it, how did this? How did you get started with all that? What's your what's your background and what led to all this? Well, background. I've been critical care paramedic for shit, thirty years now. Um, so that's sort of it. And, and the, the, the backgrounds in wilderness and remote medicine. Um, Kristen, my wife, who literally owns the company is emergency medicine PA, also with a background in wilderness and remote medicine. So, it, you know, 19 years ago, I think it's 20 years ago, next month, actually, come to think of it, we started a company catabatic consulting, and we did consulting for uh, projects in remote areas, medical consulting. So what kind of equipment? We taught wilderness medicine courses for the folks that were at these locations. So that was kind of the, the start. And then, you know, I never combined the, the guiding or fly fishing side in with that company. I mean, it took 10 years, 15 years to get that done. And you know, I figured the industry was already dialed. I mean, we had gone to a few lodges just personally. I never really asked. I mean, I didn't pay attention because I was there on vacation. I was fishing. I just assumed they were dialed. And when I started doing these fly fishing shows, like talking about first aid for guides and stuff, we got asked to, to go to a lodge up in Alaska, dial them in, do an emergency action plan, man, the light bulb, it just went off. I had no idea. And I mean, once, once it got going, I, it just took off. Uh, we had some great people in the industry, Carter Andrews, Oliver White, you know, buddies of ours that kind of made the connections for us. And from that point on, except for this Rona situation, we've been nonstop since day one. Nice. So, yeah. Um, so to answer your question, Scotty, we do, we go down to a lodge, kind of check out their operation and we do custom wilderness first aid courses, you know, specifically for what these guys are, are doing and what they may see with their clients and their lodges. And then we dial in an emergency action plan, you know, for the staff and management if, if the shit hits the fan. Right. Yeah. That's um, much needed. I know it makes some of these lodges are so out of reach. And you've done a lot with the, the, hel the heli fish and the helicopter lodges as well, right? The super remote places. Yeah. To, well, I mean, I got down in Chile for La Cotalla heli fishing. Um, so that was, and I was a flight medic. So it's pretty cool for some of these operations that have fixed wing and roto wing. You know, we, we know the operation. It's not like we're trying to guess what it's like to have those kind of moving parts in the lodges. So that helped a bunch. And you're right, most of our most of our lodges are more remote. I mean, we do um, not smaller, what am I trying to say? Shorter courses for like the walkway and more of the local river type guide services that do have access to 911 or emergency services. But then we change everything up when we go remote, be a little more detailed and and just the right stuff. I mean. Hey, don't get me wrong, uh, like a American Red Cross or American Heart first aid course, man, they're great courses for what they're designed for, right? right. You know, shit hits the fan, take care of life threats the first eight, 10 minutes. And then, you know, the medics and the fire monkeys are going to show up, right? But at the lodges, you've got to extend that because there is no emergency services. 
So yeah. yeah, that's kind of what we're dialed in. Yeah, it's 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 interesting if you look at your uh, Instagram page, Fins West. Like you said, they're they're uniquely tailored, um, and you can see pictures of Bahamian fishing guides trying to pull a stretcher off a flats boat. You know, that's something that would be hard to do if you've never done it before. But you know, if you've practiced it a few times, then you're you know you're more confident in yourself, and you know people come out in much better shape that way. Yeah, man, and and that's it. It's literally just creating like a a mental stat- snapshot. So when the shit does hit the fan, it's not the first time these guides and staff have to think about, oh, let's get a plan. I'm sure they could pull it off, right? But right. once they've done it a few times and understand a little bit about medicine and first aid, it's a game changer. And it's blown our minds. I mean, we knew this being educators for, for medicine, but I mean, when we were in Guyana at Rewa, you know, this is a village in the middle of the you know, jungle down there, I, it, the, the way it was received, it was just incredible because it's something they didn't have access to. It's the one thing, I mean, you know, these, these guides are insane guides, fishermen, reading water, watermen, boatmen, and women. But the one thing that's lacking that we found is the medical side. The one thing that's in the back of their head all the time, what are we going to do if, if something happens? So, it's good stuff. I'm, I'm glad that we're, you know, able to provide this for lodges and m- most have been on board a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just terrific. I know when I, uh, I traveled to some shady parts in Asia, I was talking to you about the global rescue. Are you guys still affiliated with them? Yeah, totally, man. They're, they're a partner of ours because we don't offer that side of things. And we, it, it's really that, cause they also have sort of a lodge outfitter program you know, where the lodge itself has a policy for their guest. So when we go down to a lodge that has this affiliation, we are able to provide that information back to Global Rescue so they know what kind of kits they have, their training. If GR has not been on the ground there, we get landing zones for, you know, fixed wing, that kind of stuff to bring back for them. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a great partnership for sure. And then also we talk about it at these lodges that aren't affiliated that maybe didn't know about them. So it's a good thing. I mean, everybody, everybody should have one of these GR policies when they're traveling just individually. I mean, I wouldn't leave home without one. Yeah. It's such a great idea. And I I think you can set it up for the duration of just your trip, or you could have it set, you know, if you're an adventurous, adventurous soul, you could have a year policy, even if you wanted, but basically they'll, if you're in an emergency situation, they'll, they will come get extract you and get you out. Correct. Yeah. So that's the, I mean, that's the, the high end of this thing. Meaning if you do need to be taken to definitive care, they arrange, they have assets all over the planet. I mean, you know, they don't show up in a jet that says global rescue on the side, but you know, and they're, I mean, their control center is insane. Yeah. push of a button, they, they dial it in. But I think the biggest benefit other than that, and that's at the end of the spectrum where shit has gone really bad. You can call them up on your sat phone or, or whatever comms you have and say, look, you know, I've got this cut on my foot, you know, what, what do I do? And they can walk you through simple stuff. They, and then they also just follow the whole thing. You get sick somewhere, you get injured somewhere, there's a representative talking to the family, the doctors to the clinic that's in, you know, Mumbai that you're in. It's just a, an extra piece of security when they do security too, believe it or not. But it's just an extra peace of mind to have in these remote locations. Yeah. So uh, obviously the Finns West stuff is, is taking you some pretty far out places. You uh, got any good stories, got any bad stories about, weird lodges, weird travel, strange places, places we should go, shouldn't go. Yeah. Go, go everywhere. And go they, everywhere. you know, the irony we're talking about this is obviously with, you know, COVID and Rona rolling into town, Finns West has been grounded. I mean, yeah. the lodges that are starting to, to get going again, which is great. I mean, it's, I, they need it, right. People need to get out and do stuff, but for our risk assessment, we've just decided it's, it's not worth the risk to, to get in, you know, let the lodges get going and, and whatnot. But my point is, it's made me realize, because for 19 years, even with Catabatic, we traveled extensively. 
Man, this last almost year, I didn't realize just how friggin' stir crazy, like everybody else, you know, that that I've been without traveling. I mean, it's it's just part of what we do, we being all of us probably listening as well, right? Yeah. Um but yeah, stories, you know, I don't know. We're the we're the folks that go in that get told the stories, so there's not as many stories medically yeah. to have. Yeah. Um, but it's been crazy. I, I, again, Guyana, when we went down to Ria, Rewa Eco Lodge to do the Arapama fishery, man, just crazy. It's exactly what people have seen the videos or read the articles. You drop down in the middle of the Central South American jungle in the middle of nowhere on these rivers. And, you know, luckily, luckily there, they, they've been fortunate, not lucky, but fortunate. Nothing real big has happened for sure. Um, Honduras, that was, a, you know, that was another crazy thing with uh, Fish for Change and Fly Fish Guanaja. I mean, they've got a, a damn remote operation off the coast of Honduras. I mean, there's a helicopter op for sure. But I don't know, the, I, the craziest thing that I've seen is black olives on a pepperoni pizza. I mean, who does that, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's pretty crazy <laughs> but yeah it's you know believe it or not scotty it these movie type stories that you see or whatever is not the most common things that happen at these places to be honest with you regardless of how remote mm -hmm. it's the simple things that turn big really quick i mean this simple coral cut on your foot in the seychelles and that thing gets infected it's a game changer right it's not, you know, heli crashes, you know, people with these crazy medical things. It's the simple stuff and how to recognize it, keep it from getting there. That's sort of, I mean, that's the main thing, just common shit that happens here, happens there. But here you go to the urgent care, there your foot falls off. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, I remember talking to you a couple months ago. You actually went through the coronavirus yourself, didn't you? It was pretty rough. Yeah, I well, and again, and I'll hammer on the system because, man, people had no clue. And again, my wife is both in Colorado and ironically here, you know, being emergency medicine PA working at a clinic, she is in, she's been in two COVID clinics treating people and, and stuff. So my point of that is way early in this thing, I did get sick. Wasn't flu season, went down for like 17, 18 days. They lost my first test. Again, my wife works at the place I got the test. And then by the time I felt good enough to go back to get tested to see, you know, it was, you know, it was done. So I don't know, we, we chalk it up to, you know, it made sense, all the right signs and symptoms. I, she was coming home every night, you know, covered in COVID. So. Yeah. You know, I guess so. I, I don't know. 50-50 maybe. Um, but again, not to get too personal, yeah, but whatever. I'm kind of high risk, believe it or not. I've had a crazy long thing happen 19, 17, 18 years ago where for the first time in my life, brother, this, uh, this shit scares me personally just because of my lung situation. Yeah. So yeah, this is the best place to be down here just hiding in the inner banks on the middle of nowhere, just hanging out fishing. Good for the soul. It is that said, and stay away from people. Yeah. <laughs> so you said she's splitting her time now currently between Colorado and North Carolina. No, no, no. She was, she was working in Colorado when gotcha. this thing hit and all the step down units and clinics, you know, sort of became the step downs for the ER. Yeah. And then ironically, when she scored this job here in Little Washington, it was the same thing, step down from the ER, urgent care type situation. But with COVID in town, it, it is the de facto, instead of going to the ER, you know, unless you're full on bad, the urgent cares have become the primary care for these folks. So it's, it's been touch and go for sure. That's wild. It's the truth, man. man. Yeah, that's wild. So once it's all cleared and I, we're, like you said, we're all kind of going stir crazy. What's, uh, what's on your brain? Where are you going? Bahamas, Alaska, where are you headed first? Yeah, man. And, and look, kind of funny when this thing hit I, before people knew, I mean, obviously being in the medical field, we knew something was going on, but it was unknown. 
we were in the Bahamas. We were on a Luther. Um, we've got a little hideaway. We go hang out in a Luther every year, a couple of times a year. Dude, we chartered a plane and got off the island because I, once we found out, we our neighbors, we watched the news and we're like, man, this is no, this is no good. So we chartered a plane to get off, to get back home. And, and it was crazy, dude. We rolled into Florida and it was a ghost town. Really? And it was, holy cow. My point is, yeah, we're at, that would probably be the first place we go back to when things are all good is, you know, even though we're here in Carolina, I'd, I'd love to walk on some white sand, 80 yeah. degrees yeah. for sure. But Finns West, you know, dude, we, we canceled 30, about 35 courses um, when this thing hit. And I hate it. I just, I, cause everything was closed and, you know, risk was too high. Hey, we're going to have to see what happens. I mean, obviously we've had a ton of our clients say, look, we need to get you back. But at the same time, they're all just trying to get through this, meaning, you know, get clients in, do the safest thing they can. So, you know, we're going to play that by ear. <clears throat> One thing we did do, which again, just the irony, when this thing first hit, we were doing COVID safety plans for our clients at the lodges which something we never, I mean, are you kidding me? But part of the emergency action plan, you know, especially Belize, the Bahamas, places like that required a government plan for these, or these, um, you know, outfitters, lodges, hotels, whatever. And the, what they were proposing just didn't work for the fishing industry. I mean, going out in boats and the restaurant, the hotel and the lodge and fishing all combined together, right? So we did that for a bit, which was great. I mean, you know, I, I'd hope, I would think we, we helped them a bunch during this to, to, to get it done. Um, but we're queued up to go back to these lodges and get going. It's been a year since they've had a, had a course or had a refresher. So man, as soon as things are safe and the, the risk is mitigatable, is mitigatable a word? I knew what you meant. Yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> I I hope we're busy um, to get these people back online for sure. So that's one thing in the back of the head is just probably we're going to hit the ground running there. Yeah, you. I would think once it, once it opens up, everything's just going to be just immediately booked. I mean, I know I, I got trips I want to take, and as soon as they allow me to book them, I'm going to book them. So, yeah, and hopefully sure. everybody's like me and that, that, that side of the industry rebounds pretty well. I know like fly sales and a lot of the shops have been doing really well just because everybody's fishing. The license sales have skyrocketed across the country, but you know, that doesn't do very well for the international travel or even the domestic lodges and things like that. They're, they're kind of the ones suffering. Right. Right. I mean, they're going, I mean, obviously doing these plans, we've been in touch with, you know, proposed and, you know, current clients, they're receiving clients. People are going down, you know, they're doing the, the safety risk and people are flying down. So it's good to see that side of the industry get kicking. And I mean, shit, man, it's, it can only be up from here. Right. right. So, you know, I guess the vaccines are going to provide some sort of safety net and, you know, if people just do the right thing, I don't know what side of fence people, are on these days, but if they just do the right thing, use a little common sense, we'll get rolling again. Things will be good. Yeah, I agree. It's common sense is, uh, is what, what more people need. I think. <laughs> I agree. So, and so you know, being on the back on the East coast, you know, we were, we were fortunate being on the, on the, you know, Rocky side of things. Cause we, we could do really quick hit. So some fly fishing shows are, you know, in on that side of the, of the country and, you know, be able to pop into some of the smaller shops to do like some quick courses, one day courses for folks. Now that we're back on the East Coast, really excited to do that here. You know, just hit these smaller shops that just didn't make sense to fly back and, and do quick hit. So I'm really stoked to start engaging with, you know, your folks down there in, in that area and my folks up in the mountains here. And we've already had several inquiries about doing a, a courses, you know, just here in the inner banks and the outer banks down here. So that's on the agenda as well. As soon as we can get out. 
yeah that's a great idea like the fly shops and tackle shops you know sign up groups and you know if you're fishing offshore especially you should definitely have a first aid kit but even inshore boats you know i had a couple of clients have heat strokes on my boat and just you know obviously bring common sense with you but it'd be good to know a couple things that you should have in an inshore boat an offshore boat so i think that's a great idea yeah there's no doubt and i'll tell you the other thing that we do is we do the hunting industry as well um i mean you know medicine's medicine and it just it just depends on you know what environment you're in on how to take care of it and again the as you know hunting duck hunting deer hunt everything down here and down your way is pretty big as well and we did we did a lot of that out west as well we had uh, and again i'm not a hunting guide but we had same situation as as us they hunting guides they were medical paramedics and they were educators that would do this stuff um, and same on our end. So, you know, the potentials here and again, we've, we've already, cause there's just, there is similar, hmm, I shouldn't say that, shouldn't say competition, but there are some opportunities, but it just isn't as focused as say Fins West is where yeah. we are guides, you know, we are medics you know, we know what we're doing. So that'd be pretty cool. So we'll, I, I hate to start ramping that up now because who knows when it can go down, but it's there. It's on the agenda. Yeah. I think that's, that's terrific. So what's the uh, plans for the rest of the day? You're going to fish this afternoon, take the old fin dog with you. Well, actually I pulled the boat yesterday because of the current weather forecast coming in, got three days in, in between this system, next three or four days, same with you guys, what it looks like on the Marine forecast. It ain't looking too good. I'm going to goof around with the truck. Wife wants me to clean up the house. I'm going to tie some flies. I ordered some from some junk company that sells <laughs> flies. <laughs> we'll get them to you. <laughs> so, yeah, no, just catch up on the computer. And, and again, with our, believe it or not, and not that people care, but, you know, our, our contract with the Antarctic program, we run their wilderness and expedition medical services there. It's been challenging. I mean, we've been nonstop with that because they've got to refuel, you know, the stations. They got to get people in and out down there. So, man, I've been staring at this computer a lot here during Rona for sure. Yeah. So, you need to get out. I've seen your pictures. You're fishing a little bit more than you let on. So, <laughs> no, there's no, I mean, look, man, it's a game changer. It's everything I expected where. You know, Colorado, you had to hook up the boat, you had to clean the snow off, you had to take the cover off, you had to drive, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, put it in. Here, man, I literally walk out the back door right here. Well, it's opposite right here. Walk down the dock, fire up the boat and go. So you can nice. get a quick, you know, hour in and then come back. It's good yeah, stuff. So, it's so good for you. You take the dog with you most of the time? Oh, well, she's down there. I mean, that's what I just looked at when I let her out. She's sitting out on the dock just looking at an empty boat space yeah. right now. <laughs> it's not going to drive but itself. I'm ready to get down your way. This panga you got is, I am super stoked about that situation. Uh, yeah, it's incredible, man. Coming from micro skiffs and flats boats and things like that, I was a little a little nervous, but it'll get skinny. I mean, it'll, as you know, in Central America, they use those things and beach them, but I mean, it's for a family and doing everything it's it's great and Slitsky and i have taken about 20 miles offshore and never gotten wet so we kind of got big dreams for it we're got a 16 weight reel coming and we're gonna go offshore a little bit on a nice day don't tell my wife she's probably gonna hear this but yeah we're gonna we're gonna push the limits of it man it's um it's just been fun fun to have oh, a yeah. boat that you can you know, with a sixty thousand dollar flats, but I was scared, scared to put a screw in it. You know, I wouldn't, dr wouldn't ever drill a hole. I would take it somewhere and have somebody else drill it. But with the with the panga, with that little custom pilot house, man, you can just do whatever you want. You know, it's it's been fun. Oh, it's it's the best of both worlds, man. I mean, that that's kind of like moving up from a flats boat to a center console that you know again was built for here. Same thing. I redid everything myself. I would never do that to a you know, full glass flats boat, but yeah. here, but yeah, man, a panga, I'm not kidding you. I looked at when I was looking at what to get down here for stability, safety, again, I ain't been on the water in years and years and years constantly down here. I just wanted something safe, stable. You could run. I looked at pangas, man, because like I said, I've been in them from Honduras to the Bahamas everywhere. 
they're they're the boat man i just holy cow they're kind of spendy as well yeah they have gotten kind of expensive it seems i've seen a couple come through charleston lately with just the holes you know people yeah. are buying the factory direct hull and then you know just building it out themselves totally, the crazy totally. thing is you can get a 22 foot boat and run it with a 40 horse motor you know no no issues really yeah. and this one yeah. i have is big and heavy it's a 22 foot and it's got a 115 and it'll still push you know upper 30s which is it's crazy this crazy little boat i love it yeah totally yeah that's a that was a big change for me i went from a 40 horse that would just scream down here that i got a 200 hanging <laughs> off the center console that's a big motor man yeah heck yeah but um, yeah i do miss my little my east capes and my little flats boat so i'll probably have to get something maybe not so big you know i'm not guiding anymore so i don't really need that four person boat but a little towy or a little uh little glide or something like that'd be fun oh heck yeah and man i couldn't i wouldn't do without the setup here you know you've got the center console that you can run out in the big water and get three or four people in it and you know and it still gets skinny i mean that thing will it'll sit in eight inches of water <laughs> fins back from the friends back from the boat up <laughs> Can't do it. I had to let dog in. Um, but man, I would not be without this hog island. I mean, it again floats in four inches of water. I can run it across these oyster beds. You can get back in these creeks where these guys can't get with these with these boats. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. with you, especially here. I mean, here, yeah. The I'll hog islands are is roto molded, right? It is, man. Yeah. I mean, there you can't you can't, you can't pull them up. Hmm? Yeah. Just, and they, they float skinny. They they pull really well. I mean, for what they are, they're like the Swiss Army knife. You can do whatever. I put a trolling motor. <laughs> I can't. I can't really say it, but I've somebody sent me a bumper sticker the other day that was great. When they saw a picture of the, the hog <laughs> with a trolling motor, trolling motors are for oh fill yeah. in the blind. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, put a cap on the front, put a trolling motor on. So now it's, it's set, man. You control, you got the polling platform. It's, and you it's had, you had that boat in Colorado. Did you have oar locks on it and run rivers too? No, didn't yeah. need to. It was totally, we were literally pulling the flats of the, of the reservoirs out there, just literally sight fishing like you would for bonefish for trout. It was, it, it, for me, it was a game changer. It got, you know, got us off the river, sort of helped that issue. And then it was just a new ball game because, as you know, we all like pulling boats. And look, dude, I got the same looks that I get here in the inner banks on a pulling boat that I did in Colorado. No different. <laughs> Maybe they're looking at you and not the boat. They were. <laughs> they, yeah, fair enough. Did you do any carp fishing out of the, in Colorado out of the boat? Yeah, to a little bit. But again, yeah. the trout situation. Again, I, I didn't re. I didn't invent anything except for getting in to these fisheries with a flats boat versus like a, a float tube where you might not be able to get to a certain bay. And you couldn't see um, them. What's that? And you couldn't see them from a float tube. That's right. I mean, even, you know, the folks on the front of the boat were way higher than you would ever be in a, in a cat or a float tube. And then I could see them up on the platform and they cruise, man. I mean, people know this, they trout up on the shallows eating scuds and stuff. They're cruising just like a bonefish for sure. Man, that sounds awesome. So, yeah, but we we focused mainly on that because, at least for us, it was kind of a new thing, a new fishery. Not a new fishery. I don't want to sound like that guy, but on a flats boat, it was. And just sort of, because there were no carp on the two reservoirs that we fished, so we would have to drop it into 11 mile or somewhere. And But we just, we just targeted, really, the trout. Heck, yeah. That's awesome. Well appreciate you talking to me today i miss you you need to come visit same here man i it, it's happening soon dude it's kind of funny I, <laughs> on that note we moved 2800 miles back home to north carolina didn't even do christmas with either of our families yeah it's kind of crazy so soon brother and it's a hop skip and a jump i ain't kidding you man i mean I, yeah I'll, be Hell, I'll, I'll meet you halfway we could fish for a day do something Heck yeah. And that's the cool thing with fishing. We've had folks do have come down um, because in a boat, uh, it, it's the best place to be during this mess, man. Yeah, totally. I mean, you're generally six feet away from people. Yeah, it's pretty funny. People, you know, when we got here, especially when we got center console, 
buddies would call and say, man, come down and go fish. It's like, dude, that'd be great. That'd be great. Um, you know, they'll come from Raleigh or come from Boone, which is six hours away or so. And I'm like, uh, they're like, well, cool, man. Can I bring anything for dinner? And I'm like, yeah, dude, there's not going to be no dinner. When we get off the water, you can get back in your car and drive back home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm dude. one of those guys. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm all for it, buddy, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll keep in touch, man. I appreciate it. Well, cool, man. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm stoked. Get that box in the mail. I need some more micros. Oh, yeah. And b- batten down the hatches for the snow. You no know, doubt. Twice. It's snowed twice since I've got here. Unbelievable. That's crazy. That's not why you move south. It ain't, but can't do nothing about it. Yep. Well, cool. Well, Mike, have a great day. Hey, you do the same, man. Yep. Be safe out there. Thanks. You too.